Hey everyone, and welcome to my Procreate demo for the piece I call the Flayer. So here's another character, he's the Flayer, and he is part of the A Village Corrupted uh, storyline that I've been working on when I have time. Uh, so it's been a little bit of time, if you go back through my old videos, um, there's the character that I'm referring to just as the Battler, and then there's the Corpse Mage, and now there's this guy. Um, so you can see that that rough sketch started sort of automatically. I actually started this in Photoshop and then transitioned to... Uh, procreate because I wanted to get up and obviously move around with it and and do it So all that rough happened before I could get into the recording situation. So now here I am uh, Starting the actual drawing process now some of the actual lines on the face here are uh, Like a Photoshop brush and then I'm switching to the fat pencil here for the actual lining It's the fat pencil that's linked down below if you're um, Wondering how I created it in fact currently which I may do in the next video I'm working with the Procreate beta for the new version and I again as I said before when I got the 12.9 inch iPad Pro I didn't even bring my brushes over I just recreated the fat pencil there's a lot of you out there who've said I followed your steps and the fat pencil is not the same and you're asking if I can share the brush I'm not going to share the brush um, it's really as simple as what I explain in that video because again I, I just recreated it um, the other day the uh, if you're not getting the exact same results there are other factors that could be involved um, one thing that I think a lot of people miss in the description down below is I work on the 12.9 inch iPad Pro uh, I'm on the second generation of that and I use the Apple pencil so if you're if, if some of your stuff is different than that that could be impacting this uh, if, if you don't have a different setup than that I just don't know what to say at that point. Um, so here we are now uh, continuing with the lines. Uh, this character in general is a vampire. Uh, he's got, he, uh, some people have said that they kind of, he kind of reminds them of uh, Grigori, the character that I did in one of the previous things. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's sort of like his evil brother, absolutely. Um, what I did with that one, and I sort of wanted to do with this one, was I wanted a vampire that had like a, not a true Nosferatu look, but almost like they were evolving in that direction. And that's what I wanted for this character as well. So I wanted to give him the big ears, but I didn't want to do like the, the no nose and the visible fangs. So he's maybe earlier in the transition, I guess you could say. They're absolutely from two different ideas. Grigori is not from this. Uh, and this ties in with those other two characters that I mentioned before. The idea here is that he is a rogue character. Um, I'm not going to talk much about the world yet because I'm still sort of figuring all that out and I don't want to like talk too much about it before any of this becomes a real thing. Uh, but uh, in this world, he is a, a, an exiled vampire rogue. Uh, he's not really a great dude to have with you, but he is essentially there because he gets a free meal anytime somebody gets killed. Um, so that's that's all you really need to know about him. Uh, you'll see as the design goes on, he's got like all those blades around his waist and those are just things that he's collected over the years. None of them have any particular story. They're just a lot of different blades because that's sort of his, his forte. So we're going to continue with his cloth here and you'll see me do an adjustment on it in a minute because it's like really asymmetrical here that was actually just a, an accident I really wasn't paying attention at the time um, so I just sort of scooted it over and scooted it up right there you saw at the end and now we're just zooming in here so that we can get a shot of his little skull collar embellishments um, I, I didn't go too hardcore with this character but I really want this character to have like a history um, and that everything that's on him came from something specific and that theoretically in the story if you really got involved in the world and you started really paying attention to the clothes he was wearing it might tell you something about the character and I don't mean in the generic sense like I did when I was doing the agony character uh, with the last two videos but more specific where it's like I don't know if this is true or not with my story, but like, let's say he's get, maybe those skulls are from a very specific house of nobles or something. And you don't find that out until much later. And then you sort of start to piece together, oh shit, this guy might actually be something to someone. And now we just know him as this, you know, something along those lines. Again, it's not all figured out, but that's the idea of what I'd be looking for uh, with the way 
technically every character is designed, but since this character is a vampire and I would theoretically have him living for a really, really long time, um, it'd be really cool to piece together his life uh, and the, the history and what it means within the world, how the world's changed along with this character and, and all that stuff. So those are the types of things I try to think about when I'm designing a character, uh, especially if I want that character to be to have been alive for a really long time. I want to make sure that I'm telling the right story that illustrates uh, in the in the design how long that character has been around for. So you'll see here that I've got this arm coming up and he's sort of standing in an awkward pose. He's sort of just holding his knife. Um, that was actually really deliberate. I did that on purpose. I sort of am fighting a lot of uh, natural inclinations with these designs, trying to make some things a little bit awkward on purpose. I know that sounds really weird, but that's sort of a thing I'm going for here. And uh, But I just felt that that was not using the space that well. And um, ultimately, I just didn't really want to draw it. It felt, it felt just kind of lame, even though it was something I was originally going for. So you'll see in a second, I change that arm um, right here, actually, uh, to be holding a human head uh, that he, of, of the dude that he has just killed. Um, it's not necessarily decapitated. In fact, it's not a decapitated human head, but the only thing in frame is the head. Now, this character's inspiration comes from a lot of different places. Uh, he obviously was inspired uh, not specifically by that Grigori character, but by characters like that, because that's what inspired Grigori. In fact, Lexington from Gargoyles is what inspired Grigori, and then this is then just a continuation of characters with little bald heads and big ears. Um, and But then beyond that, uh, I wanted to fold in influences like uh, Draven from uh, Darksiders uh, with all the blades. Uh, he doesn't go so far as to have all the blades stabbed into him because he's not a ghost, but, you know, uh, this belt full of blades, I thought that was really cool on top of that. He's got inspiration from Vampire Hunter D um, because D was a big influence in general on these new stories that I'm cooking up. Uh, D along with Castlevania and a bunch of other super dark stuff like Bloodborne is a lot of what's been inspiring these ideas. So uh, there's a little bit, I figured if I'm going to have a vampire character, I'll get a little bit of D into this character, which is where sort of the horn on the shoulder comes from and some of the more leathery looking bits of his suit. Um, and then other things are just a bunch of sort of sparse uh, bits of inspiration. The way that I draw his claws and his hands are is inspired actually by a drawing that I did a long time ago of the main character from Crimson, the comic book Crimson. Um, they do some pretty awesome claws on those vampires. Those vampires are very feral. And so when I did my Crimson piece, I did that, and then when I was doing this, I was just sort of thinking of that piece, and I was like, oh, shit, I should totally do something like that. So that's that's sort of the layers of inspiration that got me to this character. And then all the other little stuff is just me sort of filling in the connective tissue of his design. Uh, so this character that is getting his head grabbed is, is just supposed to be sort of a faceless Gennaro person. Um, they're not anybody specific in the world at all. Now, I know the I, at this point, I've got two pieces under my belt that are the coloring style and the line style and the sort of armor style that I'm going with for this story, this development world. And I knew that I was going to put the blood in similar to the way that I did the, the battler character, the very first character of the A Village Corrupted series, um, series of art. It's obviously not like a show. <laughs> um, and... Uh, so I knew the way I did the blood there, and I was going to do that again here on this character. So that's why the, the scratches are drawn in, but I w I'm going to add the blood and the color. You'll also see that there's two bite marks in uh, his neck, and that's not added here. I end up, when I'm in the middle of doing all of that stuff later, decide to add it in. So we're giving this guy a good old-fashioned medieval mullet.
So we're going to experience a bit of a jump here in a second. I was having uh, a couple of problems with Procreate on this piece uh, where I, it was crashing on me and I was losing little bits of progress. And the lines on this one, uh, because I was starting in Photoshop and I actually just saved that PSD over into Procreate, the dimensions of this was much larger. I don't remember what they were. I usually, when I'm working in Photoshop, hover around five, excuse me, 6,000 pixels by 6,000 pixels. And then I, you know, it gets a little smaller, or slightly bigger from there, depending on what I, uh, what dimensions I, what ratio I want it to be. But when I brought everything into Procreate, that was a little on the large side. So what I did was I just kept the file big for the lines. And then when the lines were done, I pulled it into a file that is the normal size that I work at on most of my Procreate pieces. And, and it's the same size as the battler character, the very first character that I did for this. So when I was working on this line, I, I didn't have all that many layers, uh, but it was still falling apart on me every now and then just because it was such a large size. I believe the layer limit that was uh, enforced was 15 or 20, something like that, because the piece was so big. So getting a lot of straps with buckles into this one, uh, similarly to the way I did that with the Battler. Um, the Corpse Mage doesn't have a whole lot of detail at all to his costume. Uh, if I'm going to actually ever do turns or complex character design breakdowns, I'll probably add more to him. Uh, as you have probably, you could probably tell from some of this, you know, that very first piece was just sort of like a fun one-off. Then the second one was sort of like, hey, the, these are kind of cool. I'm going to keep making these. Now we're at the stage where I'm doing a third one, and if I sort of hit a third one, now it's like, okay, let's create some rules, let's standardize some things, let's beef some of these designs up. And so I think the battler is fine, and I think this character came out great. Uh, I'm really happy with this character, but the corpse mage could use a lot more to him. I think he's got good character, but his, his costume is pretty lackluster. I mean, it's just like this big, blankety, black cloak type thing. So we got straps here to sort of echo what's going on with the battler and all these buckles. It just adds a lot of tangibility to the world, which is pretty fun. Also, drawing buckles and leather straps and all that I think is just really fun in general. So I want to add as many of that as many of those things as possible. Now we are moving down to the weapons. Part of what got cut, unfortunately, was just my quick rough of these weapons. And now here I am tightening up the lines for them. As I've explained in past videos, these are all on tons of little layers that get collapsed as I go so that I can adjust things here or there. Uh, and, and you'll also see like, you'll see there's the crazy, crazy rough at the beginning, which was just sort of me saying like, and then some bullshit around his waist. Then it goes to like a tighter rough, which is like, okay, it's not just bullshit. It's like a sword and a dagger and this thing. And then it goes to, all right, now I'm going to solve each one of these and do a tighter rough still where I'm answering all the questions for myself. And now this stage that we're at here is where I'm actually doing the, the clean lines on it. The weapons that we've got here, he's got this belt buckle that looks really fancy, like that came from some specific thing. Then he's got this big spike with a, with a hook on it. I sort of intended that to be like a very crude, st simplistic stabbing or throwing thing, but that the way that he could potentially wield it might be incredibly elegant. And he hooks it on his finger and flips it around and throws it, or he can tie something to it and use it like a weapon. Um, I've stated in the past in various forums that one of my big influences is Hiroaki Samura, which you probably don't see a lot in my work, but I think about him and his art, particularly on Blade of the Immortal, all the time. And so when I think about the way that Manji from Blade of the Immortal uses like his various weapons and he might all of a sudden tie a rope on to the end of something that you didn't realize that's what it was for. Or he'll take this weapon and that weapon that he's used individually and he'll lock them together and make a different weapon. That kind of stuff I just think is really cool. So here for this sort of major dagger, this major blade that you see on his belt, I wanted to just do a quick symmetrical flip in order to do this one. So I did a rough of it and now I'm doing 
one side of it and then there you can see duplicate it flip it and then start filling in all of the uh, the, the connective tissue right through the middle of that as well as adding some damage to it as I go to bring in some uh, some asymmetrical qualities to a symmetrical weapon and then you can see there I place it and then I realize I got some extra stuff I need to fill in so I start filling in all that and that's how we get that so now we've got the buckle done this spike thing done we've got the first dagger done and now we're just adding some extra outline to separate these shapes off of, of everything else around them. And now we'll start working on that other sort of bigger blade. You could sort of assume it's a little bit more like a sword. Um, I stop on it in a second and jump to something else because I realize this is going to be uh, a little more complicated without finishing off his body. So we move away from that to elsewhere. So now I'm working on that, that blade up on his back. So if you're counting now, that means he's got that blade on his hip, he's got the spike, he's got the dagger, he's got the unfinished dagger next to that one, and then he's got two blades on his back. And that's sort of, you know, what we've got right now. Or what we can see he's got, I should say. Now, I wanted every one of these swords to feel like they appeared in the same world, but that he got them from very different places. Uh, one of them could be a ceremonial dagger from some specific thing, and another one could be from a warrior tribe, and he just happened to like it, so he grabbed it. And maybe one is from a honorable paladin, and the other one is from a cutthroat that he murdered in the night or something like that. So that was sort of the mentality behind these blades is make them look like they can coexist, but make them look like they come from different places. In the palette, that's where a lot of the harmonization comes from uh, for this, for, for all these different weapons. So that was me wrapping up a bunch of nicks and scrapes, and now I'm going into that last sort of dagger that's hanging there on his belt. This one's a little bit on the crude side compared to some of the others. It's going to have like two ropes that are sort of crisscrossed on it. Um, I don't know if that means that they came from it or if it's something that he attached to it later, uh, but that's sort of the gist of, of that one. Okay, so now we're just erasing away all of the stuff that is overlapped with the swords. Here's an example of me keeping everything separate so that I can clean it up after the fact. Now we're moving on to that bigger sword, uh, finishing up the end of the handle there. And a lot of little tweaks going on because I... Sometimes I'm working on this stuff like either in a meeting, a lot of the time I'm watching TV, or I'm, I don't know where I am, I'm in a lot of different places. So there's a positivity to that, which is that you can work on stuff wherever you are. You can always be working. There's a negativity to that, which is if, you, if your attention gets divided, you might rush through a thing and then you have to correct it later. So sometimes you'll see that manifesting in these videos since it records absolutely everything. In fact, it's kind of funny because sometimes when I'm working in Photoshop now, I, if I have to like redo a thing, I'm like, ah, oh, damn, this is going to look like shit in the video. People are going to get bored because I, all I did was screw this up and then redo it. Um, so I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that when I'm in the middle of doing one of these things, if I zone out and fuck up a piece, then it's just going to make the video that much longer. Cause I'll, I'll, you'll have to see me completely redoing it.
<laughs> so you can see there I made a note where I said oof just because that thing's a little bit of a mess but I think it it'll be fine <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. It's sort of like that SNL quote that I think it's a Lorne Michaels quote which I'm going to paraphrase which is you don't go on because you're ready you go on because it's Saturday night um, and that's sort of what happens a lot with art. So now finishing off his torso there so that we can see all the different things that need to be erased from that one particular blade. There's the legs now. So that was a, an area where I lost the recording. Um, but you can see I've got a little bit of his arm now in that corner. I know it's not much, but it's at least a little bit of a framing device. And now I'm putting the shadow from the a distant blade that's sort of like on the back of his belt in silhouette so that you can see that there. So now he's got legs, he's got shadow for the other blade, he's got arms, all the blades are done. And now I'm just going to add some additional outlining to some of these weapons so that I can separate them off. Uh, theoretically, I don't have to do this. It's more of a stylistic choice. I think that especially once the colors come in, you'll be able to see everything uh, sitting together and you'll be able to tell, oh, that's that and that's that. But um, for the sake of uh, more of a stylistic choice, I decided to outline those a little bit more heavily. And lastly, I thought that he could use a little bit more embellishment, so I just added a skull brooch, so to speak, clasping his uh, parts of his, uh, his cloth, his shawl, his scarf, whatever this is. Um, I was also in the middle of doing, when I was doing this piece, I was doing a lot of the stuff for Agony, and I was jumping back and forth, so this might have been a little bit of an influence from, from Agony over here. This one here is, uh, this is fairly basic, just doing a skull uh, that looks like it's angry and kind of stylized, and then duplicate the half and flip it, because that is in this symmetrical some of the symmetry that I'm doing in this is also going towards the sort of awkward posing. Um, that's going to probably sound a little weird, but it's by, by making a couple items straight on with the camera, I'm sort of deliberately trying to flatten things. Um, I don't really know how to explain that better than that, but if you look through all of these pieces, including what you'll see in the next I don't know if it's going to be the next video, but the next character, I do this every now and then as a deliberate means of uh, trying to flatten everything. Um, so now here's the final shot of the lines right there. So this is what the lines look like. And then I take this whole thing and I copy it and I'm pasting it into uh, a new document, which is what this is right here. So now you can see the lines have been brought in. They're set to like a light brown, but then that light brown is set to multiply. Uh, it's like the very same method that I used in the last two uh, because I'm trying to keep the pieces all the, like they're built sort of in generally the same way. You can also see some of the fill process that I go through here. I've altered the way that I'm filling these things a little bit. I'm sort of using the paintbrush to define the entire area and then I'm doing the trick where you drag the color from the circle in the top right into the field to then fill that. It still doesn't do what I wanted to do in the past. I, I've said that I didn't like the way that it screws up some of the aliasing. I still don't like the way it screws up some of the aliasing. The only thing is that with these pieces in particular, I can get away with it because of the lines. I would never do that on a more rendered piece because there's no support there to sort of distract away from all the little errors. And sometimes when I'm in the middle of doing these, I see those errors and I correct them and it just gets a little bit annoying but I live with it in these pieces. So here you can see some of my color choices coming into play. That sort of sickly yellow green I thought would be really fun for him. The other characters, like if you're looking at color schemes, the very first character is like mostly uh, brown with the red, and then the second character is mostly blue. So with this character, because he's a vampire, I wanted blood to be a key factor, but I didn't want him like dressed in red. I wanted him in something that was going to contrast that quite a bit. So in the end, you see that the background, you'll see that the background is all red, and there's definitely this foreboding, bloody, murderous vibe, but he doesn't really have that in his color scheme. He's instead got this sort of sickly green color to him. So here we are just doing the details on the dead guy. 
giving him five o'clock shadow and some blush and and the scars on his face. Uh, and now I'm erasing away because I'm reordering some of those layers there. Here is me putting in the blood that I mentioned before. So putting in some soft, fuzzy blood like it's been smeared around a little bit. And then I actually will put a little bit of splatter from one of the splatter brushes. Here you can see some damage to his neck where he bit and clawed at his neck. And I'll add a little bit of splatter, but then I'll use that the smudge tool in the top to then smudge it all around um, so that it looks like it's not just splattered blood. It's also been a little... Um, it's been touched in the, in the kerfuffle, I guess you could say, which is this part right here where I'm sort of smearing parts of it around. Now here's just some highlights to make that part look particularly wet. And then that last bit was just darkening some of the edges of the inner mouth so that it had some depth to it. Um, so now we're up here on the skin for this guy, adding, like really emphasizing the, the blood that you can see through his semi-translucent skin, giving him a little bit of a five o'clock shadow that's on the blue realm, like maybe his hair actually isn't a normal color, uh, putting some splattered blood on his face and uh, smearing that around as well so that that looks... Um, like he just freshly chomped the shit out of this guy. And then his eyes are uh, bright irises and dark corneas. And then I did that scar stuff up there so that he looks like he's got um, scars. I actually really love just the general palette of his head. I like the way all those colors play quite a bit. Now you can see here I made that one gem uh, red. But then I go through and I end up changing the gems to not be red and to be white instead. Uh, because I thought that was actually kind of cool and I thought that it might be interesting to make like a diamond um, Something that's important in this world uh, at least for him or maybe that's why he's grabbed all these weapons There's something about that diamond kind of goes back to some classic RPG stuff about like socketing a diamond and what that does Now the background suddenly popped in there. That actually isn't a mistake um, That's because I borrowed this from another mock-up I can't show you the other mock-up because it shows too many things uh, that I can't really reveal right now, um, but I thought it would work really well for the background here. So I brought it in, and that, that background was actually black and white before, and then I just made sure to bring all of this red into it to really try to sell it. Um, so now I'm doing that rim light on his shoulder, and that just got wrapped up. And then I realized I missed a couple of color spots right there. I went back in and redid those. So this, was, this is with all the shadow layers and all that stuff turned off. And I'm just making a couple of variations to the metal so that it has just a little bit more visual interest down there. And then with all this stuff turned back on, this is what you get. So this is the uh, final version of it. I hope you guys dig it. Uh, this guy was a blast to do. I think you're really gonna like the next couple of characters too. I'm gonna do a few more and then I'm gonna wrap this up for now. Um, but uh, for here, thanks for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed this, please consider liking and subscribing, and hopefully I will see you on the next video. If you're looking for me on the internet, these are the places where you can find me.